The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. I'm Courtney Kendall with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, also known as NREL. I'd like to begin by thanking all of you on the phone for joining us this afternoon. We're broadcasting from the NREL's brand new state-of-the-art research support facility in Golden, Colorado. Our presentation today will feature information about the standard work specifications online tool. First, Josh Olson, who is the Training and Technical Assistance Specialist for the U.S. Department of Energy, will provide a general overview of the SWS tool and how it supports the U.S. Department of Energy's new quality work plan. Next, Steve Lomely of NREL will provide a demonstration of some of the key functionality that this tool has to offer. And lastly, Amanda Evans of the New Mexico Energy Smart Academy will share some of the ways that she has incorporated this tool into her weatherization training program. After the presenters conclude their sections, we will answer questions from the audience. We will get to as many questions as time allows. We are going to give participants another minute to call in and log on. So while we wait, I'll go over some logistics and then we'll delve into today's topic. First of all, in case anyone is curious, today's presentation will be posted online. You will be receiving a link to the presentation via email after it is made available. If you have questions during the presentation, please go to the questions pane in the control panel showing on your screen. There you can type in any question you may have during the course of the webinar. We will then strive to address your question during the Q&A segment of today's presentation. Again, thank you all for being here today, and with that, I will turn it over to Josh. Josh? Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. So my role here is to give you the background information on the project that, that sort of created the standard work specifications as a, as a tool themselves. And there's sort of a bigger project that surrounds the overall effort. Um, and I'm going to go briefly over the main components of that project and then talk about how the standard work specifications fit into that um, before we get into the details of the standard work specifications themselves. So the overall project is called the Guidelines for Home Energy Professionals. And the intent of this project was for the Weatherization Assistance Program, which is housed with the Department of Energy, to use the resources and the expertise that we've built up over the past 30 years of doing home retrofit work and build out sort of a suite of resources that can apply to the entire home energy upgrade industry, but using sort of that core uh, institutional knowledge that we've got here in the weatherization program is the springboard. And so the idea was that until we started this project and really until uh, a couple of years ago, the home energy industry was sort of a disparate effort, right? There wasn't any sort of common set of standards, common set of reference materials, common set of even certifications that really sort of bound the industry together as a cohesive thing. And the idea behind the Guidelines for Home Energy Professionals project was to put in place the basic building blocks so we could actually build out some of those common resources. And the logical fundamental place to, to begin was in actually defining what the work is that the industry does, right? Actually breaking it down to the very basics and say, well, what is it exactly that the industry produces? Everybody else is able to do this in other industries, you know. Automakers are very clear in what they do. They build cars, right? Plumbers are very clear in what they do. Uh, the home energy industry didn't really have that foundational document. We had sort of this vague idea and this, these vague promises of saving energy, but when you actually broke it down and had to explain to consumers what you were doing in the home and sort of what, what metric or what standard that was meeting, that's, that was really missing. And so the idea behind the standard work specifications was let's do that. Let's convene a group of experts. Let's sit down and let's, let's hash out exactly what it is, exactly what tasks it is that we do in homes every day, and what the idea is behind those tasks. What are we trying to achieve when we do those tasks? And so the end result of that, of that brainstorming was the standard work specifications, and this is a document that actually lists task by task almost everything you might do when you go into a home to do retrofit work. Now, it's not everything, obviously. It's not the entire universe that we're addressing, but it does hit almost all of the primary components of what a retrofit crew might do. And the way the SWS is structured is that we look at it from the result. So we take something like sealing an attic air hatch, for instance, and say, well, what's the result you're trying to achieve? What's the outcome you're trying to get to when you do that measure? 
and then define that. And from there, we can say, well, what are the basic underlying building blocks that will get you there? So if, you know, ceiling and attic air hatch is meant to create a uniform R value across that opening and to keep air leakage from occurring from the conditioned space to the unconditioned space, well, that's your outcome. That's what you're trying to get to. When you've achieved those two things, that's when you can say you've done a good job with the attic air hatch. That's the standard that you're meeting. And then the specifications piece is, well, what are, what are the basic things you need to achieve to get to that outcome? So with the attic air hatch, well, you probably want to have a consistent R value across the opening. You probably don't want insulation to spill into the house with the homeowner opens their attic hatch, these kind of things. So the SWS really take a basic look at what does it mean to do that task well. Now, how you actually achieve that on the ground, what materials you use, how you actually build the box that covers the hatch, um, those sort of things are really left to the crew to decide. So the idea was to sort of split the difference between providing a really hard and fast standard and then allow crews to innovate on the site to, to work with the materials they have and the techniques that they're used to working with. So the hope is that it's really going to act as a foundation and that folks in the field are going to be able to innovate and build on top of it rather than us trying to provide a prescriptive path that may or may not work for everyone in the field. And so from the standard work specifications, once we sort of laid out this this big broad document that sort of created a menu of possible things you might do in a home and then what it would mean to do that well, those desired outcomes. Then on top of that we can now start building out the rest of the resources that would really sort of try to make the home energy industry look like a cohesive whole. So once you know what the work is, well then you can start figuring out what does it mean for someone to be able to do that work, right? And that's where we get into things like job task analyses which we built out for the four jobs that we feel like the home energy upgrade industry primarily uses. That's the auditor, the inspector, the installer, and the crew leader. And for all those, using the standard work specifications, we're now able to, to figure out what are the knowledge and skills that they need to do their job adequately. And that's what we call a job task analysis. And that's something else we've built out under the guidelines of home energy professionals project and something that the industry can use when hiring, when building training, and when building certification. And that certification piece was the last part that we that we attacked under our project because we looked out there and said, well, for the weatherization program, um, there are a lot of good certifications out there, but none of them are quite tuned exactly to those four job classifications that we built the job task analyses for and exactly what we do in the field. So we took those job task analyses and we built out a certification structure around them, right, what we call a, a certification framework, which means if you have those job task analyses, take the auditor, for example, if you know what it is that an auditor needs to know and be able to do to accomplish their job, well, what would it mean to build a certification that adequately measured that? And so the certification framework is something that the Department of Energy with NREL built out to sort of be that third, pro the third product coming out of this project, right? So the certification framework says, well, you probably need to have some time sitting in front of a a computer screen or with a pencil and paper actually answering some questions on paper, some written questions. But then equally as important and maybe more so is the field exam component. And what are the, the things that an auditor needs to be able to do in the field to really prove that they're able to accomplish that job and do that job effectively? And so that framework is what is now in place for certifying bodies like the Building Performance Institute or others to pick up and actually build certifications around. And the Building Performance Institute is building some certifications around those those things for us uh, just to jump start that, that effort itself. And so those three things, the standard work specifications, the job task analyses, and the certification frameworks were the big three products we developed to sort of help support the industry. Again, using the weatherization program as a springboard and sort of that institutional knowledge base, but really to build out a product base that could support the entire industry. And just to go back to the development process for a minute, we did include along with the weatherization folks, many, many industry folks who are not necessarily directly tied to weatherization. So we had a lot of private contractors, folks in HVAC, plumbing, electrical industries, building trades, all those folks, other federal agencies who might be looking to use these products in their programs, all those folks were involved in that development process. And everyone was given a chance to comment and sort of help refine the products before we brought them to market. Um, and so that's kind of the background of what we're, of what, um, develop the product that we're really going to talk about today, which is the standard work specifications. Um, and so one more piece of this is now in the weatherization program, we've taken 
those three products and we're starting to embed them in the program itself, right? We didn't want to build them without actually moving them into a place where they would be an important component of the weatherization program itself. So again, sort of the idea of this was a weatherization program would kind of incubate all these products and make sure that they worked and use our vast network of folks who are doing this work every day to sort of make sure that these things were all fitting together in the way that we thought they would. So now we're moving to the position of in the weatherization program starting to require these in various places. So the very first thing that's going to be required is that the standard work specifications are going to now have to start being the fundamental basis of quality in the program. So all the field guides, all the field standards developed in the network are now going to have to be based off of the standard work specifications. And it's important to, to also note that the standard work specifications aren't going to change a lot of what's being done in the field, right? The idea was that they were capturing the good work that was being done already, writing it down, and just giving it sort of an objective basis to measure whether or not the work was done correctly or not correctly. So a crew that is not there doing this work well for a long time, nothing's going to change much about what's going on on the job. What's going to be different is now there's an easy way to measure it and to know that you're meeting the intended outcome of whatever task you're doing. And when someone's inspecting that work or someone's asking for your ability to provide sort of a quality assurance mechanism on your work, now there's a standard way to do that. So it should reduce a lot of issues with people talking and using different um, different terms and thinking about things in slightly different ways. Now we have a document that at least everyone can reference back to. So if someone's coming along and saying, well, is that installation installed correctly? Now we have a standard work spec that says, yeah, I can show you I can show you what I base this work on and you can see that it's meeting these these specifications that are laid out here. And hopefully that'll reduce confusion, reduce the time spent sort of on that verification and quality control piece. And so weatherization is going through sort of an evolution right now where we're trying to figure out how do we move these products that have been developed as the foundation into the program itself. And again, that first piece is going to be folks starting to use the standard work specifications as the foundation for their work. Won't change a lot of what's happening at the crew level, but it will change how folks are inspecting and how folks are training. Um, and I think I should mention one more piece of that, and that's our training program uh, accreditation. So built on top of those standard work specs, on top of those job task analyses, we also implemented a, uh, a training program accreditation through the folks at the Interstate Renewable Energy Council, um, very well reputed folks who do accreditation for, in the past, renewable energy training programs, but now have picked up the energy efficiency side for us and are doing great work. So now we have an, the ability of training programs to validate that what they're doing is based on these on these core documents as well. Um, so I think that it sort of covers the the overall background of the project. Um, and I think that's all I've got. Anyone who has questions, feel free to type them into the chat and I'll be happy to answer them at the end. But I think that's a pretty good overview. And I think we'll hand it on off. Great, Josh. Thanks a lot for providing with, with that overview of the guidelines project and the goals behind the standard work specifications. As Josh mentioned, this really is about defining quality in the weatherization and home performance industry. And so with that, I'm going to jump into some of the details on the standard work specifications tool. So the standard, this uh, is a slide of a screenshot of the details of the standard work specifications tool. And in a few minutes, I'll navigate through the tool to demonstrate how information is organized and displayed. But as Josh mentioned, the standard work specifications define the minimum requirements to ensure that the work performed during energy upgrades in single-family, multi-family, and manufactured homes is effective, durable, and safe. The SWS can be used as an industry guide for workers, training instructors, homeowners, and program administrators involved in the home performance industry. NREL and DOE developed the standard work specifications in collaboration with industry subject matter experts program administrators, health and safety experts, weatherization contractors, and product manufacturers. We also had federal po uh, partners like the US EPA, the Department of Agriculture, and the Department of Housing and Urban Development. The result of all of this collaboration was three separate highly technical documents surpassing 1,500 pages in total. So there's quite a bit of content. And NREL was tasked with making this content accessible and integrating the content into an online tool to make it easy for users to search and find specifications as they uh, related to particular energy upgrade measure, such as ceiling drafting, drafty windows. In order to do this, and as part of the effort to organize the SWS content and make it accessible, 
NREL implemented a user-centered design approach to ensure that the new tool would meet the needs of the home performance and weatherization community. So we began this user-centered design process by conducting several rounds of stakeholder and audience interviews, which was then followed by the development of user personas and user scenarios. So for example, we thought about how a training program instructor, a quality control inspector, energy auditor, and WAP grantee might use the SWS as part of their daily activities. So you can see here, this is just an example of some of the user personas that we created. Um, a training program instructor, for example, might be interested in preparing training materials for a course. They might need to be able to find specific details and copy and paste them into a lesson. Um, an energy auditor, likewise, uh, might need to prepare for a home energy audit and uh, need a way to create a list of easy to retrieve specifications that she could reference on the go. Quality assurance and control inspector might be writing a home inspection report and a WAP grantee might be receiving a call from a grantee and need to be able to quickly refer to the SWS to confirm an answer and send the specification to the grantee. Pursuing that user-centered design process enabled us to follow a process of collaborative sketching, prototyping, and finally user testing. So we really thought about all of those activities and how we could create a tool that would help support the goals of each of those personas that we had created. So the process allowed NREL to test our initial assumptions of how users would want to interact with the tool and allowed us to develop features that our audiences actually want, as opposed to just unnecessary add-ons that might be cumbersome and ineffective. In April 2013, the SWS online tool launched with basic features and content for single-family homes. Since the initial launch, content for manufactured housing and multifamily homes has been added, along with additional and more advanced functionality. So this slide lists some of the key functionality that I'm going to be demonstrating today in just a moment as we dive into the SWS tool. Um, first of all, ability to navigate content in several different ways based on user preference. You can also print, copy, to Excel and email specific details, create custom sets of details using the favorites functionality, and create quality control inspector and energy auditor checklists. You can also print the entire standard work specifications by housing type directly from the tool. Built into the tool, we have a dynamic glossary uh, that gives definitions for some of the acronyms and key phrases that are used within the standard work specifications. And then there's Spanish translations currently available for manufactured housing and single-family standard work specifications. And we'll be releasing the multifamily Spanish translation shortly. There's also an application programming interface, or API, which allows third-party programmers to leverage the resource or the database behind the standard work specifications and create customized tools for the weatherization and home performance industry. Some additional uh, pieces of functionality and, and uh, issues that I'll be covering in the tutorial are how to identify references, how to submit comments and feedback, how to sign up for project updates, and some of the future resources that we'll be um, incorporating into the tool, such as a how-to video and a commenting tool that allow you to comment on individual specifications. So with that, I'm going to transition to my web browser and show you the standard work specifications online tool. All right, so here we are on the home page of the Standard Work Specifications tool. Um, again, the SWS tool allows you to find, print, email, copy, and save information on how to successfully complete specific home energy upgrades and streamline your work. To get started with using the tool, we recommend that you first sign in so that you can use the tool to email, create, customize checklists, and save your favorites. So I'm going to begin by going to the top right-hand corner here. Um, So sign in right here at the top, and you'll see that'll take me to a sign-in page. If you haven't created an account yet, you can click on the Create an Account link and enter information into the required fields. So within this, uh, you enter in your email address. You can also add in your organization, city, state, and job title and create an account. All registration information is kept private, so once you create an account, you can then use uh, the customized li list um, to generate scopes of work create checklists for quality control inspections, and share favorites um, with via the print, email, and copy to Excel functionality. So I already have an account, so I'm going to go back to the sign in here, and I'm going to enter my information.
So I've entered my username and password, and I'm going to go ahead and log in. So now I'm logged in. You can see at the top there's now my favorites link, and it'll show um, that if I want to log out, I can log out right there. Okay, now that we're logged in, let's get started. First, there's important links on the home page. Uh, we've got the learn how to use this tool, and this is a good place to start if you're new to um, the standard work specifications tool. The learn how to use this tool provides a quick tutorial on some of the key functionality that I'm reviewing today. It'll give you step-by-step -step instructions for navigating content, printing details, managing favorites, and sharing content. So these are some of the key topics up here, and they'll hyperlink you to the section of the help um, that you're interested in, and that's a good way of learning more. Uh, as a future update, we'll be including a how-to video that will actually walk you through some of these steps. This information is also always readily accessible via the help link in the top right-hand corner, so that'll take you to the help page as well. I'm going to return back to the home page now. And I want to point out another key piece of information, the read and introduction to the standard work specifications. So this is really important if you're new to the standard work specifications in general. It gives a good introduction of how they are created and how they're to be used. So by clicking on this link here, you can get a sense of um, some of the things that you need to think about prior to using the standard work specifications. For example, the significance of a whole house assessment. Obviously, before you begin retrofit work, you want to do a home assessment and an energy audit to figure out what types of retrofits are needed. And once you have that information, you can dive into the standard work specifications tool to actually find out what the details are that are associated with each of those retrofits that you've identified. There's some information on the numbering scheme and the way that the content is organized um, with you know, the detail number, the specifications, and the objectives, so it explains that. And then it also talks about the role of codes and standards in the SWS. So while the SWS will help identify the desired outcomes of energy efficiency measures, um, they are not a replacement for codes and technical standards mandated by a particular jurisdiction. There's also information here on the role of U.S. Environmental Protection Agency Healthy Indoor Environment Protocols. So again, I encourage you to read this as sort of an introduction to the standard work specification. Going to return to the home page again and point out some additional functionality. So additional content on the home page includes information on how to get certified. Josh talked about the new home energy professional certifications, and here's an easy link to information um, on the home energy professional certifications. There's also a news and updates section where we provide information on changes to the tool or new functionality. And then there's uh, a way that you can download the original uh, PDF of the standard work specifications as well as the Spanish translations. So you can see here we have uh, the single family PDF and the Spanish translation of that document, the manufactured housing PDF and the Spanish translation, and lastly the multifamily document. And that Spanish translation will be coming soon. The news and updates section highlights important content updates within the SWS as well as functionality improvements. So by clicking on the read all news and updates, you can get some more detail on these two topics that are highlighted here. So one example of some new functionality that we just released is enhanced print functionality is now available. So I showed you the PDFs on the home page of the tool, and while the PDFs of the online of, of the standard work specifications for each housing type are available for download, uh, the content in the PDFs is only updated periodically. So for the most up-to-date SWS content, you really want to access the content via the SWS tool. However, if you are interested in creating a printable document with the current SWS content, meaning it'll pull the content directly from the tool, you can now generate a printable web page with complete content by housing type via the following links. So this is pretty data intensive. Uh, you're pulling, you know, two to 300 specifications for each housing type, uh, and it's in beta release right now. So due to the intensive data processing required to generate each web page, we recommend that you use a web browser such as Google Chrome or Firefox. Just below that, we recently made a content update to one of the details changing um, the way that it referred to uh, appliance efficiency, and that's just a note there explaining that change. So in time, we will also allow registered users to, have, uh, to receive these notifications directly via email, so we'll post them on the news and update section, and then you'll also be able to receive those via email if you are 
uh, if you do have a user account on the standard work specifications tool. Now let's dive into some of the content. I re re return to the home page again, and I want to start out by showing you the mega menu. So the mega menu is this information at the top. Um, as you scroll over any topic area here, you can see a menu of subtopics to, to choose from. So the topic area is health and safety, air sealing, insulation, and within each of those are subtopics. So I'm going to start by looking at health and safety and dive into the insulation subtopic. So for example, we've picked that insulation subtopic. It'll take me to a screen with the details for insulation. There are two of those within that uh, subtopic area. From here, you can also navigate to other topics and subtopics using the left-hand navigation. Uh, I can expand and collapse these um, terms on the left-hand side to get a sense of some of the other topics and subtopics that are available within the standard work specifications. Now right now, we are on a high-level uh, page. So um, the information displayed at this point is just the, the overall numbering scheme, the topic area, the detail name via the hyperlink here, and then the subtopic, the desired outcome, and what housing type it pertains to. So this first topic here, 2.0104.1, is insulation worker safety. The desired outcome here is work is completed safely without injury or hazard, hazardous exposure. And this pertains to the single family and the manufactured housing standard work specifications. Just below it is a similar detail that pertains to multifamily homes. So to get to the actual detail, you can click on that hyperlink name. So I've clicked on insulation worker safety, and it's taken me here to the actual detail. And you can see this is where we have all of the content laid out in the table. It gives you the different sections um, of the detail. It provides you with the specification itself and the uh, objectives of that specification. Now I'm going to navigate back to the home page and, and show you another way to find this information. And then I'll show you some of the functionality that's available within the details. So the search bar at the top is another way that you can find content. I'm going to go ahead and enter in the search term insulation. And then I'm going to click the Go button. Um, right now I'm searching across all housing types. You can also narrow it down from here and specify uh, if you wanted to return only results that were available in a single housing type. All right, so I've pulled up search results for every specification in the standard work specifications um, that have the term insulation in there. You can see there are about 39 of those. From here, I can narrow it down again. If I do want to just return results for single family, um, I can click on this checkbox here on the left, and I'm down to 13 results. If I wanted to further narrow things down and was only interested in details related to air sealing, um, I can click on another checkbox there, and I'm down to uh, one detail here. So another interesting thing about this faceted search that I'm showing you right now is you can go ahead and remove all of the checks that you've made, and you can remove the keyword that you've entered, and it will return all of the details for the entire standard work specifications across all three housing types. So if you're interested in just pulling up single family homes, you could remove that keyword. You could click on the single family checkbox and return all of the details that are relevant to uh, the single family home standard work specifications. Now let's return to a detail page. So I'm going to take you back to um, one of the details here. Just give me a second. So we'll go back to uh, global worker safety. So global worker safety, I'm interested in exploring this detail a little bit more. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that hyperlink and take you to the detail. And I'm going to show you some of the functionality that's available within the detail. So there are several things you can do with the specifications. You could either select all of them or select individual ones. So um, if I were just interested in, in some of these, I could just select uh, individual ones. But I'm going to go ahead and select all of the um, details that are within the global worker safety um, specification here. And from this, I can print, copy to Excel, or email them. So first I'm going to show you how to print the specifications. So again, I've selected all of, all of the um, specifications within uh, the global worker safety topic here. And I'm going to click the print button. And what that does is it generates uh, a new page that is formatted to print. 
So from here, you can print the page just like you would any other web page by selecting um, File, Print from your menu, and it'll uh, you know, send that to your printer or give you a print preview page. Another thing that you can do from this print page is you can create a quality control checklist. So if I click on this box right here um, where it says Create Quality Control and Checklist, it'll turn the table into a checklist by adding these boxes here on the left-hand side. And so you could print this out, you could take it to a job site with you as part of a quality control inspection. And you could actually go through the home that had this retrofit done and check boxes to make sure that each item was co um, corrected or put a not applicable in there uh, or add some additional notes. And then at the bottom, there is a signature line and a date line. So you could actually submit this paperwork as part of a requirement to provide a quality control checklist. I'm going to take you back here to our previous detail page. So if you want to copy the specifications to Excel, you can again select the ones that you're interested in. I'm going to go ahead and select all again. And you can, co uh, you can hit copy to Excel. And so what that does is it copies all of the content in this table here and preserves much of the formatting. So then you can go into Excel and you can actually paste that information in, and then tweak the formatting to suit your needs, add additional notes, that kind of thing. So this is a pretty handy way to, um, to get the information and put it into a usable format such as Excel. So lastly, uh, if you are interested in sharing content, again, I've selected all of the details within the specification here, I can use the email functionality. Now again, this is something that you need to be logged in um, as a user in order to do, so you want to go ahead and create that user account. account. Um, but what it does is it takes all of that content and it allows you to share it with people. So this is an email with standard work specifications detail to a friend, colleague, coworker. You can enter in your email address up here. You can edit the subject line to suit your needs. And then you can also include a personalized message if you want to uh, make a comment about the specification that you're sharing or say that it pertains to a certain address where retro work is being done. You can add all that information, and then it will include all of the content in that detail. And then you'll just go ahead and click send at the end, and it will send that email from the user, uh, user account that you have on file. So I'm going to go ahead and go back here. Just give me a second. So another thing I wanted to point out is the favorites functionality. So um, as you're exploring the standard work specifications, you might see that there are certain details that pertain to a training program that you're putting together, or pertain to a retrofit project that you're doing, or apply to a rebate program that you've structured. And so the favorites functionality is really a way that you can go through, explore the content, and highlight individual details that pertain to your program or to your project. So global worker safety, if I decide that this is relevant to one of my projects, I can go ahead and add this to favorites. So when I click on this favorites functionality right here, it'll provide me with um, either uncategorized, if I haven't set up different categories yet, or you can see I have set up categories already. So I'm going to add this to my 1234 Maple Avenue retrofit project. I could also add it to some of the other ones that I had. Maybe this also per pertains to a quality control inspection I'm doing at 622 Main Street, and I'll show you where that goes in a second. So to see where that's been added, you can navigate to the My Favorites link at the top of the page. So here's where all of those specifications and details that I've collected are stored. You can see Global Worker Safety has now been added to the Maple Avenue Retrofit Project. It's also here under the 622 Main Street Quality Control Inspection. Now within favorites, I can do um, many of the same, or all of the same things that I can do when I'm viewing an individual detail. Again, I could decide to select all of these. I could you know, pre print um, all of those, and I'll just show you really quickly. It's going to process all of those details for printing, so this includes all the details I've highlighted in that individual topic area. I can print those. I could also create a quality control checklist based on all of those details. going to return to the My Favorites page. Some other things that you can do is you can edit 
your little buckets that you've developed. So if I decided um, that this was no longer necessary, I can go ahead and delete it. Click that little trash can there. It'll ask me if I'm sure I want to do that because it cannot be undone. In this case, I do not want to do that. So I'm going to hit cancel. I can also edit the name. So if I want to carry this over to a new project, I can go in and I can click the edit and I could change the title here. So I could make this into a different uh, street name. You can see it's changed the name there. And if I decide I want to remove some of these, I can go ahead and um, uncategorize. I can add it to a different bucket or I can remove it entirely um, using that star functionality there. So the last thing I wanted to point out is within your favorites, you can go ahead and favorite, uh, you can filter those by housing type. So you'll see at the top there's a three different housing types, and you can check and uncheck those boxes to display details that pertain to certain housing types. Now there's a few final items I'd like to review before we wrap up this tutorial of the SWS tool. So I'm going to return to the home page. I'm going to navigate back to global, let's see, global worker safety here. So within details, um, there's two things here that I wanted to point out. First of all, some of the details have additional reference material. So for supporting material, you can see reference standards that are part of the standard work specifications. So this is detail 2.0100.1. I'm going to go ahead and go to the list of reference standards in the standard work specification. So this pulls up all of the references. It'll give you a um, list of acronyms. It'll show how um, some of the, it'll show some of the different publications that are referenced in the standard work specifications. And then it'll also show how certain details relate to um, outside codes and standards like the 2012 International Residential Code. So this is organized by IRC number and then the corresponding detail. I'm going to go ahead and scroll down here to show you um, how it's organized by SWS detail number. And so you can see we're just looking at detail number 2.0100.1. And so these are all of the detail, or these are all of the corresponding um, codes and references. So this is where you would go for additional reference material. In the event that an outside coder standard is, um, is necessary to, to performing uh, some of the work in the standard work specifications, it'll be referenced directly in the specification itself and won't be um, sort of referenced as an outside code and standard. I'm going to go back to the home page one more time and show you um, a couple last things here. Sorry, forgive me. There's one other thing I wanted to point out. So I'm going to navigate back and point out the glossary that we've developed. So within the standard work specifications, there are certain terms um, that do have definitions associated with them, terms and acronyms. So for example, right here we have SPF. I don't know what that means, so highlight, hover over it, and it'll show me the definition. SPF refers to the spray polyurethane foam. If I click on that term, it'll take me to the entire glossary for the standard work specifications. So these are all the terms within the SWS that have definitions associated with them. So now I will go back to the home page. So another thing I wanted to point out is that the standard work specifications has that application programming interface that I talked about um, during the, the slide presentation portion of this. If you click on this link right here where it says API, It'll take you to another page that provides you with details on how to use the API. So again, the API is a tool for your developers. It's something that will allow them to create web services that pull information directly from the database behind the SWS tool. So if you have a savvy developer on staff or you happen to be a savvy developer, you can actually use the API to create mobile applications or personalized content built on uh, the standard work specifications themselves. And again, if you had a mobile application and it was relying on data, if we made an update to content in the SWS tool, your content would update automatically as well using that API. So one last thing, also on the home page, you'll see that there's this Contact Us form, and we encourage you to use that. So if you click on the Contact Us page, um, it'll uh, provide you with an opportunity to send us your feedback on the SWS tool, 
point out errors or ask questions about the SWS or the SWS tool itself. So that concludes the overview of the SWS tool, and at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Amanda Evans of the New Mexico Energy Smart Academy, who will share some of the ways that she has incorporated this tool into her weatherization training programs and other um, home performance work. After that, we'll take your questions. So just give us a second here to transition the slides and get back into the PowerPoint presentation. So hi everybody, can can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm yeah. going to start. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to start off uh, telling you a little bit about New Mexico Energy Smart Academy, and uh, so you can see the variety of people that we are introducing the tool to. Uh, we are one of the national weatherization training centers, and we are recently have been IARC accredited for all four of our weatherization programs. Um, we teach workers in the federal low income weatherization program. And we do a lot of workforce development. We teach uh, builders who want to brush up their skills for new codes, uh, people who want to be HERS raiders, BPI certified, uh, and CEUs for a lot of different people. And we're also part of Santa Fe Community College. So we teach credit classes uh, for students who are seeking associate's degrees uh, or certificates. And we have green construction technologies and energy auditor programs uh, that are within those degree programs. So, so we found that the SWS can be useful to all these people, and we want students to feel comfortable using them and understanding the importance of them. So I'm going to show you uh, three ways we've come up with to introduce them to the SWS in an engaging way, and I'm sure uh, you probably can think of a lot more after you've seen these ones. So next slide, please. Uh, so this first one is called the SWS scavenger hunt. So students need to know that the SWS exists, and how to navigate through the online tool and find out what's there. So I'll set up a problem for them, and, and here's one example. They're told to go to the heating section of the SWS, and then within there, if you go to the next slide, they have to choose one of the individual specifications, and they get to write a scavenger hunt clue for fellow students, and then the students have to hunt through the heating section to find the answer. So, so those of you who are familiar with the video uh, Grandma's House will realize that if you see the next slide, here is the next slide. Here is one of the clues that one of the students wrote, um, and I'll let you read it. For those of you who haven't seen the video Grandma's House, it's a, it's a really funny, short, cute video. But this student took uh, the character's in that video, which is Big Mike, Grandma, and Red, and wrote a little clue around, um, around this SWS. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see that this is really what he was looking for the answer. He was looking for the answer of a co-compliant walkway and service platform so that when Big Mike was walking around in the attic, he wasn't going to fall through the attic. So this is the, the, what he was looking for, and if you can see the next slide, here is his question, and here is what the student answered. I blanked out their names. So he found that and wrote, a co-compliant walkway would be installed to prevent Big Mike from dropping in on Granny and Red while they're having lunch downstairs. So, so this is a game that we use to familiarize students with the online tool and to see what type of information is in there and how to navigate through, and they really enjoy doing this, and they'll come up with all kinds of weird scenarios. So the second game we use is the next slide, and it's called the last one standing game, and um, basically when you think about airline pilots, they use checklists extensively, and in fact in most construction these days, they have extensive spec sheets, detail sheets, workflow charts, and people just don't rely on their memory. So that's what this game aims to show people. It's the, there is this great SWS tool, and that you don't need to rely on your memory. You've got something that's better than that. So depending on how many students there are, um, I might split them into pairs because it's more fun and they feel less anxious and put on the spot that way. Um, and then I'll give them the name of one of the SWSs. For example, you know, general preparation for a non-IC recess light cam. Um, and you can start with a fairly straightforward one, or you can, and then get more complicated as you go through. So they've then got 
two or three minutes to write down all the basic steps they think would be needed to achieve that outcome. And after they've finished, I'll pull up the relevant SWS page on the screen of uh, the computer screen, and they'll check to see how many steps they missed. And usually there are a lot of steps they missed. And so then the pair or the person that's left the most out will drop out and they'll become the, the inspectors for the next round of the game. So it's a bit like musical chairs um, until there's really just a couple of people left. But the point of the game is, is not to show who's the best person at memorizing. It's really to show that they've got a resource um, and they don't have to try and remember. It makes them realize that you know, all the steps that they're missing and even the best people are still missing steps at the end. So, so, and that's really important is to stress to them that it, it's not really a memory game. It's to show how difficult it is to, to try and remember all of these steps. And then the third thing we're doing, which is the next slide, is more a tool than a game. And we're creating visual references for the SWS. So we took um, some of the ones that we use most often in our state, or that uh, most often don't get done right, and are putting some visual references for them. So uh, as my friend who's a contractor says, um, if, if he had really liked reading, he would be a lawyer. And I think um, many people who are in home performance, home energy work, you know, they really relate more to pictures than to text. So having the, the pictures is just a really good um, visual recall for them. Um, in our state, we're going to use these as a, as a deck of cards so they can be online or as a hard copy, just so they've got something to go look at if they, if they want to go and see really what uh, the outcome should be. And those just three of the ways that uh, we've come up with so far to introduce this. Uh, we introduce it to the weatherization crews and other people in the field. Um, and thanks for your time, and I look forward to your questions. And this is my um, contact information if you want to get hold of me. Great. Thank you, Amanda, and Josh as well. That was some really great information. For those of you who can stay with us, we're now going to address some of the questions that we've received during the presentation. So Amanda and Josh, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute yourselves um, so that you can respond to questions as well. Uh, but first, um, one of the questions that has come in is, uh, how do you propose new content? So when I was walking through the standard work specifications tool, I noted that there's a contact us form, um, a link at the bottom of the page. If you click on that, uh, you're more than welcome to send us recommendations for new content. Um, the SWSs are uh, an, an industry developed um, group of standard work specifications. So we really do rely on industry feedback and collaboration in order to develop those. And for that reason, some of the um, recommendations for new content or edits will be batched and will be reviewed as part of an industry review process. Um, so we'll probably be doing that um, at, at a regular, regular interval moving forward. Um, but at this point, the most important thing to do is to submit that content to us so that we can consider it as part of a future update. There was another question about linking to the developer site. So again, if you look to the bottom of the SWS tool homepage, you'll see a link for the API. And if you click on that API link, it'll take you to the developer page where you can find information on how to develop queries that will actually pull data from the database behind the standard work specifications. So again, uh, that API link is, is the link to that developer site. So there's another question, Josh, that uh, I thought you might be able to answer, and that was, uh, when do these standards take effect? Um, so I was wondering if you could just talk briefly about um, DOE's plan for uh, thinking about how these standard work specifications will be applied um, through the weatherization program. Sure. And so I can only speak to the weatherization program specifically. I think it's important, also this is a minor sort of nitpicking detail, but they aren't, they aren't actually standards. Standards have an official sort of flavor to them and go through a different kind of process. These really are um, meant as guidelines and sort of industry industry instructional documents and that sort of thing. But um, for the weatherization program, uh, we are developing guidance now that's going to figure out how to moving forward it's going to be adopted into the program. We presented a draft of sort of what we're calling the quality work plan, which is going to wrap up all the things in the weatherization program related to work quality. 
And as it was stated there, currently what we're going to do is in the next program year, in program year 2014, the idea is that folks should be using the standard work specifications in their field standards and in their field guides as the foundational document. And then moving into, through the 2014 and the 2015 year, we'll start requiring that all weatherization jobs are inspected with the standard work specifications as sort of their fundamental um, underlying standard, if you will. Um, so that's, that's the idea. 2014, start incorporating them into field guides, field standards, and start making sure that folks on the ground and the crews are, are, are understanding how they work and how they're going to sort of be inspected to. And then the inspection requirements will kick in in 2015. Great. Thanks, Josh. So there were uh, some other questions um, just reading through here. Just give me a second. So there was a question with respect to the cost of anything that was discussed in terms of the API, that kind of thing. So there is no um, cost on our end associated with using the information in the standard work specifications or utilizing that API functionality. Uh, and let's see if I can navigate back to the SWS site. Someone had asked again, um, for me to highlight specifically where the links are. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up my screen again. So the two links that I referred to in terms of letting us know about new content and also accessing the developer site. Um, down here again on the bottom of the screen, you'll see this Contact Us page. That's where you can go ahead and submit questions, uh, submit ideas for new content or edits. And then the API link right here is what will take you to the developer page. And so again, uh, no cost on our end to use this information and to access information from the database. However, you would need to have a skilled developer helping you to create a web service that would actually pull data. So that would probably be um, time and resources on your end in order to access the, in order to turn the API into something relevant for your organization. So there was another question about outside codes and standards and, and how they're referenced in the standard work specifications. Um, so what I was getting at there is that in some details, uh, there is an outside code or standard that um, is, is mandatory in order to perform the work to the desired outcome. In that instance, uh, the actual standard and code will be referred to at the line level in the detail. Um, if it's just for additional information or additional reference, that's when you'll see um, a link to the additional references and standards. So a if I can just jump in there, a specific example of that would be ventilation, right? So in order to meet ventilation standards, it'll say ventilate to 60, ASHRAE 62.2 standards. So that's, you need to know that 62.2 spec in order, and that standard in order to meet the actual specification, so it's referenced in the spec itself. Great. Thank you, Josh. Um, there's another question here. Will the PowerPoint be available on WAPTAC? Uh, so following this webinar, we will actually post um, the, the recording and the slides to the SWS site. And then we'll also work with uh, some of our partners like WAPTAC to see if they can post that information on their sites as well. So there's another question here. If required for inspectors by 2015, do they have to have an inspector certification for the weatherization program? Uh, Josh, is that something that you're able to elaborate on? Sorry, can you repeat it for me? Um, if, uh, let's see, if, the, if required for inspectors by 2015, do they have to have an inspector certification for the weatherization program? Yeah, I believe that's yeah, so that's yeah. So in 2015, everyone who's inspecting work as a quality control inspector in the weatherization program will need to be certified as a quality control inspector. Starting in the beginning of the 2015 program year. Great, thank you. There was another question about managing favorites. So I'm just going to quickly navigate back to the tool again and show you the favorites functionality. So um, within your specified favorites, you can add and delete items. Um, however, I don't think that that is available within the uncategorized section. So 
If you haven't already gone ahead and set up individual buckets like I have here with the property address and the multifamily rebate program training resources, um, that's where you'll be able to go in and remove uh, details from your list of favorites um, and, and kind of manage things that way. I'm just looking through our questions here. So there was one question here that said, as there are changes to a particular SWS, will there be a way to track when a change took effect? So there's, um, the way that we're handling that right now is, again, we recognize that for a lot of the updates that we may need to make or additions that we may need to make, those will have to be part of an industry review process. So we'll want to collect um, that information, uh, have some of our subject matter experts and industry partners look at it, make sure that um, changes don't need to be made, and uh, that so we'll batch those and make future updates. Now there are some changes that we're able to make right now, and we've we started to do that. And I showed you the news and updates section um, on the home page of the standard work specifications tool. So at this point, that's where we'll go ahead and, and alert users to the fact that we've made a change. So anytime we make a change to um, anything of consequence in the standard work specifications, we'll go ahead and include a short write-up there. And then as I also mentioned, um, one of the things that we'll be doing is we'll, we'll add the ability to push those updates out to people who have user accounts on the standard work specification site. So if you're a registered user, um, you'll not only see the update on the home page, but you'll get an email notifying you to the new uh, news item or update that we've added. So there's another question here, again, asking about um, codes and standards. Are the standard work specifications kept current as the associated codes or standards are changed? Uh, and so, Josh, is that something that you can elaborate on as well? Yeah, so we're going to go through regular updates in the standard work specifications. Um, we just released the initial version, and the thought now is that at least every year the standard work specifications will get a complete revision, and when we do that, we'll actually go through and look at the reference codes and make sure that the references are appropriate and updated. Great. Thank you, Josh. Amanda, we have a question for you, and this question is, what type of placement um, do you have for weatherization workers? So I think this is getting at um, how you're able to place workers in the field after they've been through a training program. Well, most of the people in our, well, all the people in our state that come through already have been hired by the weatherization agency, and then they are sending them for training. Um, so we don't have a program where we are training people and then sending them out into utility programs, for example, because we just don't have them. Okay, thank you, Amanda. Uh, there's another question here again pertaining to favorites. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and navigate back to sharing my screen here, and it was how do you add a new folder. So I'm on the My Favorites page right here, and right here um, I'm hovering over New Group. So that's where you can create a new group of favorites. If I click on this, it'll take me to a new window where I can create um, a new list of favorites. And I'll just go ahead and add that. And then you can go back to the My Favorites page and you'll see that I now have a new folder available to store favorites down here at the bottom. Uh, there's a question here again, Josh, that's um, a little bit technical in nature, and it, um, it's a question about CAS limits and CAS testing. Uh, so I know that there are um, individual details within the standard work specifications that do refer to CAS testing and CAS limits. Um, and I don't know if that's anything you want to elaborate on or not. Um, well, I'd have to hear the specific question. <laughs> this is just generally about CAS limits. Yeah, does the SWS contain CAS limits? Uh, the SWS contains, yeah, the SWS, SWS does contain CAS information. Um, and, yeah, so when you're looking at general auditing procedures for combustion safety, the SWS does go into that level. Okay, thank you, Josh. So 
So there's a question here, are there any other reasons to register an account other than my favorites? Um, so yes, uh, number one, again, I talked about how we will be in, uh, building some new functionality that allowed you to receive updates. So as we do make changes and add news and update items, um, if you are a registered user and you have entered your email address, you'll be able to get those um, updates sent directly to your email. Uh, but again, um, it's the My Favorites functionality that is, is the most beneficial and the key reason to create a user account. And then also if you do want to share um, content via email, so if you wanted to use that email functionality that I pointed out, you also need to be logged in to do that. Uh, another question here related to changing content, how difficult is it to make changes to the SWS pages? Um, so the beauty of using an online tool is that we can make those updates relatively easily. Uh, the, the complicating factor, of course, is um, working with subject matter experts and in, in, in collaborating with industry to make sure that we're thinking of all of the implications of that change. So um, for small edits, uh, we're making those right now, um, but if it is something a little bit more technical in nature, we're preserving those as part of an industry review process. And maybe I could just jump in on that point. So I think that the dividing line there is that if there's something that, you know, there's a huge document with a lot of detail in it, if there's something that we've just gotten wrong right out of the gate, um, those changes can be made pretty well straight away. If we're missing a code reference or something, there's a number that's off. Um, that sort of stuff we can change immediately. If, there's, if folks want to make additions or there's details they feel need to be included or they feel like a procedure or process is, um, in their opinion, wrong, that's where it would probably take into the next update phase for us to run it through subject matter experts and make sure that information we're presenting is as accurate and as relevant as it can be. Thanks, Josh. There, there was a, a question about speakers, so I just wanted to quickly say um, Josh Olson from DOE has been speaking. This is Steve Lomley from NREL. And then we'll also have Amanda Evans from uh, New Mexico Energy Smart Academy. And then uh, we had Courtney Kendall helping us out with some of the logistics in the beginning. So there's another question here um, related to JTAs and SWS uh, and really getting at what the difference of those two documents are. Uh, so Josh, that sounds like a great question for you. Sure. So the difference is that the, the standard work specifications are defining the work, right? What it is we do on the job, what are the various tasks we do, air sealing, insulating, health and safety, that sort of thing. Uh, the job task analyses take those various things that we do on the job and create a document that says what is a what does a specific worker need to know and be able to do in order to achieve those those tasks. So if I'm an installer and uh, I need to be able to know how to insulate according to the SWS and air seal according to the SWS, the job task analysis is a list of all the knowledge, skills, and abilities that I would need to have to be able to achieve those tasks. If I would basic reading and writing skills, know how to use certain basic tools, know how to um, you know, operate the insulation blower, that sort of thing. So that's the difference. One is the actual work itself and the tasks that, and how to, what, what it means to perform a task correctly, and the other is what is a worker who would be doing those tasks need to know and be able to do in order to achieve those tasks. Great, thanks. So there was uh, another question related to certifications. and. At the beginning of the presentation, Josh did go over the home energy professional certifications. Uh, and so the question specifically was, um, what other certs are there other than ResNet or BPI? So the home energy professional certifications that were developed through the guidelines for home energy professionals project um, are the certifications that we've been talking about here. So again, I'm sharing my screen on the home page. And you'll see on the lower left-hand side, there's Get Certified. And that's where you can find more information on the home energy professional certifications that um, we've been discussing. And those certifications are currently administered by BPI. So we have a number of other questions, um, some related to CEUs. I think we're going to um, have to follow up with those of you who have asked that question. Um, afterwards, and then we're also going to be posting um, the Q&A 
with this webinar as well. So when we post this information, we'll go ahead and let all of you know where it's available. And then for those of you who have asked questions that we've been able, unable to respond to, um, we'll go ahead and follow up with you directly via email. So um, again, I think at this point, those, those questions that we haven't been able to get to, um, we will follow up with you individually. And um, I just wanted to quickly ask, do Josh or Amanda, do you have any other last minute thoughts you'd like to share? Not, not me. Thanks, um, David. Yeah, no, just for me, I think that keep in touch with us. This is, the entire guidelines process is ongoing and always evolving. So anyone that has any concerns or questions, please feel free to contact us. And, uh, let us know what your thoughts are, and we'll be happy to get back to you. Well, thanks again, everyone, to participating for participating in today's webinar. As a reminder, we will post a recording of today's webinar to the News and Updates section of the SWS tool. We'll also work with some of our partners, such as WAPTAC, to make sure that that information is linked to from some of those partner sites. Um, we've had a great audience, and we really thank you for your time this afternoon and for the questions that you've posed. And again, if we weren't able to get to your question, we will follow up with you. Um, after this webinar. So please feel free to email us at workforce.guidelines at nrel.gov uh, or use the contact us button on the SWS homepage if you think of any additional questions or if you would like further information about the tool. So thank you again to Josh and Amanda. Um, appreciate everyone's time today and we hope to hear from you again soon. So thank you and have a good afternoon. This is our webinar.